This is a story about a dude named Lane. He moved to the mainland and bought one place to stay. And then one day he went and tried to rent them out. And then he became one real investor man. Hey guys, it's Lane Kawaka with Simple Passive Cash Flow. Today we are going to talk about the coffee investment with David Swell. How's it going, David? Hey, going very well, Lane. So before we get started, we'll quickly go over this legal disclaimer, which you guys can read your guys self, but we are not uh, giving out any legal or CPA advice today. So consult your, uh, your professionals for that. So if you guys don't know me, I um, run a podcast and blog at simplepassivecashflow.com. We help hardworking middle class build real asset portfolios by providing free investing education, podcasts, and other networking opportunities. Plus access to investment opportunities not offered to the general public like today's coffee and chocolate investment. Uh, if you guys are interested, please sign up for other videos like this and podcasts at YouTube, Stitcher, Google Play, iTunes. And if you guys are local to Hawaii or want to join our online Facebook community, you can check us out on Meetup and Facebook. Today, we are going to be talking about this uh, coffee investment that I found last year, actually probably two years ago, when I first met Darren at a bar. And uh, he told me about this uh, International Coffee Farms, which is a real estate based, especially coffee farm ownership opportunity, where for under 20 grand, you can own a half acre parcel titled in your name and it's already operating coffee farm in Panama. And on top of that, you get the turnkey management to go out on your behalf and work the land, pick the berries, sell the uh, coffee berries for you with an average return of IRR of 10% plus for former return. I wanted to say thank you to all the Simple Passive Cashflow listeners. The content has been all over the place from turnkey rentals to turkey rentals and now to syndications and private placements. The feedback from some of you is that it's been a bit of a roller coaster or a Korean drama to follow the website's content. To memorialize the past and clean up things, I have created a free web course to get you up to speed by signing up at simplepassivecashflow.com backslash start or text the word SIMPLE to 314-665-1767. Again, join the free web course, The Journey to Simple Passive Cashflow. Go to simplepassivecashflow.com backslash start or text the word SIMPLE to 314-665-1767. I'm going to bring on uh, David and introduce his team and you know, how, how did this all get started? Because you didn't start off with uh, coffee or anything in the food business per se, right, David? It was No, no, I did not. Um, uh, my background is in corporate finance, really. I raised money for startup businesses uh, for uh, 25 or 30 years. Retired in 2006, moved to Panama. Wasn't doing much except watching the tide go in and out. Moved to Boquete, moved into the eastern area, the western area of, of Panama, with the idea of starting our own coffee farm business. I had consulted earlier uh, in 2011-12 to a Colombian firm who was doing specialty coffee, trying to build a specialty coffee business. We created the business model, which is the current business model for them. And Darren and I were consulting to them. We had met each other in a different consulting role in uh, precious metal business uh, in 2011 decided to work together after that. Uh, we did the uh, consulting work in Colombia. We parceled and sold uh, 640 half acre parcels for the operators down there in about a year and a half. So we proved the concept of this business model that we're using now in international coffee farms here in Panama handily. It worked out very, very well for the operators of the uh, coffee farms in Colombia. They no longer wanted to continue because they had a huge farm and they needed to digest that. So uh, although Darren and I had continued to live in Panama, not not in Colombia, but consulted to them, we decided we would do the same thing here in Boquete. That's when we met Andres in um, here in Boquete. Andres born and bred in Boquete, been uh, in the industry most of his adult life. Uh, he's a professional engineer as well, uh, so he thinks like you do, Lane, and uh, we like that because it's a uh, the logical methodology of thought that goes into what he does in coffee, plus his hands-on experience uh, in the dirt. And he's been doing that 
for a long time. He knows the business cold. He has been involved with the Specialty Coffee Association of Panama for a long period of time. Panama and Boquete are famous for their specialty coffee. The world comes here to Boquete to buy coffee. We don't have to go elsewhere to prove that what we have, they know what we have. And Andres is a key figure in that. So over a spaghetti dinner in 2014, we talked to him, Darren and I talked to him about what our idea was, and uh, he was fully on board from that day on and has been since. And he, We were reminiscing just the other day about our linguine and clams and how we decided that we would put international coffee farms together and that's where we are today right. and he's kind of like a michael jordan of coffee in that community there he's michael jordan of the coffee without the, the bluster he's very very right. private very quiet uh, he keeps a low profile um, he just simply develops the best coffee possible and he won't release it to anybody until it is the best coffee possible his attitude is we, we should be number one in coffee and when we are number one we will release the coffee and we're in that stage right now where we're growing these farms uh, turning farms around that we bought that we're already producing planting raw land farms that but we can engineer and design to our own specifications growing those exactly the way we want them fixing the soil fixing the varietals that are being planted for to meet the demand um, doing a lot of the Boots on the ground, hard work every day, preparing the business for the time when the trees are producing. We have producing trees now, but not very much. And the coffee is excellent coming off the farms that we've acquired and will just be that number one coffee that we've talked about when we're finished. And we're producing hundreds of thousands of pounds of coffee in a couple or three years. And Andres is ably assisted by Jose Saracini, who is uh, also an agronomist, and he's our, what we call in Spanish, a mandador. He's the farm foreman. So he runs the team, of which there are probably 35 people, 30, 31 farmers every day, all day in the field, and three or four staff working with Andres as uh, our in-house biologist, as an example, Valentina Pedrotti. She's our value chain analyst, and Andres is also assisted now by a young lady named Anna Staff, who is also an agronomist. So with his experience, two agronomists and a biologist were well-scienced up here. And, and this is something that I didn't catch on until like halfway through the first day on the coffee tour was that, oh, you guys aren't just like a cash crop. You guys aren't just stripping the whole, all the beans off the trees. This is specialty coffee. Absolutely. Specialty coffee is... Like you say, the Brazil or Colombia, they grow vast quantities of coffee, but they do it in a commercial fashion. A specialty coffee is managed tree by tree, and we have in the order of 250,000 trees planted now on these farms, and their tree, each tree is managed individually. The cherries are picked individually, not mass produced or mass stripped off the branches one cherry at a time when it's perfectly ripe and the farmers will pass through the farms many 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 times during the harvest to pick only the ripest cherries that can be processed so that's one key to specialty coffee the processing is another key and that produces a zero defect coffee and we mean zero out of that whole bag of beans that you get it looks like a pound i don't know how many beans are there because i've never counted them we should have a contest to see who can guess how many beans are in the bag. Um, that there's no no defects. We mean zero defects, not one defect of bean in that bag. That's specialty coffee, and that's what gets the price that we uh, have forecast in our pro forma and the price that we're getting now for the albeit small quantities of coffee we're producing, but it is very high quality. So Darren and I have been at this since 2014, along with Andres. And it's a very well smoothly operating team. In 2016, we decided that we could branch out into Belize and do the same thing with cacao. And for those of you who don't know, cacao or cocoa is the base ingredient in chocolate. And it's grown on trees too. Big pods of 30, 50, 60 beans inside. The pods are harvested. The beans are taken out of the pods. The beans are are fermented for six or seven days and they're dried for six or seven days in a very specific fashion. And the, the processing is what turns ordinary organically grown cacao into fine flavor specialty chocolate it's the key and 80 percent of the quality comes from there so we've been doing that for since 2016 we have three farms over there in belize we have a belize cacao traders operation there the trading company buys and sells beans it will buy and sell the beans from uh, the p e plantations that are the 
three farms we own over there. Also currently buys cacao from 154 local farmers, which will be 200 to 250 farmers by the end of this year. We buy their wet beans and then we process them in, into specialty cacao. And then it, that is further refined into specialty chocolate in our subdivision or in our other division called Mahogany Chocolate, which is ably run by our executive chocolate maker, uh, Luis Armando Chaco, who has 15 years of experience in chocolate, eats, lives, and breathes cacao and chocolate. And I can say that we have some of the finest flavor, best tasting chocolate that you can ever imagine. And recently we've taken that expertise and rolled out two chocolate bars in the in Belize. Uh, we want to be in the retail business as well uh, as the uh, store business that's in the resort in Ambergris Key and that uh, we've rolled out two bars, one targeted at the um, high end for tourists to take back home and one at the uh, local end for the people that live and uh, work in Belize on a daily basis and can now proudly eat some of their own chocolate in a Belizean made chocolate bar that's not imported from Hershey's or, or Mars or somebody else and the price is appropriately adjusted downwards so that they can afford it. So that's what we do over there. Coffee farms in Panama are 10, as we've said before, currently acquiring our 11th farm. They're all, they've all been sold out to a, around 300 individual people who have uh, taken advantage of uh, being a gentleman coffee farmer in Panama part of our merry band of Panamanian coffee farmers, as we call them. Um, on a managed basis, they you know, control about 545 parcels now and $10 million worth of real estate and that we manage uh, for them uh, on a 100% basis. So it's not anything you need to raise a hand to do, but that team we just talked about of 35 people here and probably another 35 or 40 people in Belize do for you every day. But the business model was built on the on the premise of acquiring underperforming coffee farms. Just like a wholesaler buys, you know, a distressed house. I mean, it's the same thing. People... I had the same idea. We're we're buying underperforming commercial property and we're rehabbing it, and adding value uh, through capital and si and know how, and dividing it into smaller pieces, allowing in, uh, smaller individual investors to be part of it. That's exactly what we do. It's a a totally analogous. Uh, operation to real estate except that our tenants are trees and they don't move out in the middle of the night with my furniture and haven't paid the rent. Trees are the key. No toilets, tenants and termites and troubles, just trees. And you're invited to come down and kick the trees. And we'll tell you about a little bit later about our tours. So capital is really is required. There's a significant amount of money involved. The coffee science is very important. Um, our sustainable farming practices are the support system that is the company is built on and we will be economically sustainable we'll make money we will be environmentally sustainable and we will leave the, uh, the land in better shape than we got it and we do that now and we will be socially sustainable as well and where we offer a, a social program to float all the boats in Belize and in, in Panama for the hard-working daily farmers that you referred to, the hardworking middle-class people and, and the not so middle-class in the farming industry, suppose Belize and Panama, um, to compensate them appropriately. One of the things we started, Darren and I, when we first realized this uh, opportunity was that only three cents to five cents out of that four bucks that you pay Starbucks for a cup of coffee is going to the farmer. And that's not acceptable. So we set out to change that with our socially sustainable program. You can read on here, the various things that go into specialty coffee. I've already explained to you that it's a tree by tree process and it really is. And there's 250,000 of them right now and another 50,000 trees in the nursery and planted a lot of trees, with a lot of, with a lot of shade and other things that are necessary. And from what I saw, you know, there's a lot of other coffee farmers, but they're all they're a lot smaller out there. They're just more mom and pa. They just have like one farm or what a few acres is what the average guy has out there. There's a there's there's some farmers that are large. There's two or three good sized farmers, families that have been in the business for a hundred years, um, but they don't have that much property. Um, at ten farms here with our size, I would say we're probably in the top five of the farmers for size, maybe even top three. Lots of little small holders that have been running their you know five, ten, twenty, thirty acre farms for a long period of time uh, with a 
limited amount of upside, whereas uh, our upside is unlimited. So we've made a fairly good splash here, which has uh, also made it a little bit more difficult to buy farms because there's not that many of them uh, that are saleable. Mostly it's from older gentlemen who are um, in their 80s and don't have any kids that want to work on the farms. Most of the kids don't want to get their fingernails dirty and they're over in, they're in South Beach in Miami and all they really want is the bucks. So we end up buying the farms from dad and uh, I don't know what he does with the money, but that's how it works. And it's not as easy as it looks. The boots on the ground part of buying a farm involves a lot of, uh, a lot of work that is specific to the farm by the time you figure out altitude and access and soil quality and wind and rain and sun and shade and, and all these other parameters that go into it. It's a, it's a science that's uh, just to acquire the farm. That boots on the ground uh, experience is, is very valuable. And, and how many, what are the percentage of, uh, cash crop and single origin, micro lot, the specialty coffee? Mostly cash crops, but there are some significant specialty coffee growers here that are small, but they have very high quality coffee, good business relationships established around the world over 30 and 40 years. One, for example, grows of fine world-class quality geisha coffee. And the geisha is a tea, in my opinion, a tea flavored light coffee that's very popular around the world, especially in the Orient. And um, last year at the auction, that geisha coffee sold for $601 a pound at the auction. So it's a valuable crop and there's a couple of guys that are really good at it. We have planted geisha last year and this year, and we're gonna be one of the guys that's gonna be really good at it too but we're not quite ready with Andres's attitude that when they're going to get off the porch and run with the big dogs, we're going to be number one. And I totally agree with that, that philosophy and that attitude. So that's all being developed. It takes time. As the screen says, five to seven years, we'll produce coffee planted from new plants in three years. And from turning around a farm, we can buy an existing farm that's underperforming and make it highly performing in specialty coffee in three to four years, but it takes that length of time to get up and running, get it, to get the steam built up behind it. And so the, as the slide says, five to seven years is something if you're considering an agricultural investment, just don't bother if you're going to be a farm flipper. You know, buy, some, buy, some, buy a single family home, rehab it and flip that, and then put your profits into something that's going to be around forever um, in coffee, in cacao and, and other agricultural products, but ag is a slow bur a slow burn, so it's it takes time. Yeah, and, and one of the reasons that I kind of bought in was, you know, like you said, that geisha coffee. If you guys go and Google that on the side now, because you guys are doing always doing more than one thing, is go look at what the frenzy is with this geisha coffee, and that's really the ace up the sleeve with this investment. Is the upside on that is pretty high, and I, I know you guys done the performo with you know just thinking that you know you'll sell that geisha coffee but you know if that thing sells for that highest price then man the returns really go up what was kind of your method for you know the numbers going into the performa well the reality is that there's no geisha built into the performa we didn't have geisha when we made this performa and we are planting it now and it's going to be an additional upside boost to the bottom line to the IRR from the geisha. Geisha is not going to sell for $601 a pound on a regular basis. That's an auction and that's an unusual event, but it does sell for 180, 200, 250, $300 a pound on a continuous basis. So there's no geisha built into that model. So it's conservative. There's no capital gains built into that model for the value of your land. And I'm going to argue that the, my, my performance says zero for 20 years is the value of your land. I'm going to argue that it's not zero. It's going to be something higher than zero, but I don't know what that number is. So I left it out and just made it zero because it can't be any worse than that. Uh, so it's conservative again. And arguably if you buy raw land or an underperforming farm and turn it around into a really highly producing farm with specialty coffee selling for eight, 10, 12, 15, $20 a pound for any varietal you can imagine, or more, uh, you've got a valuable piece of property on your hands. So there's a couple of places where it's uh, obvious that there's an, uh, some sandbagging going on in the, in the performa, you know, with the underperform or under. Yeah, you don't want any worries. You live in Panama. <laughs> yeah, I live right here by the coffee farms. I'm, you know, and I don't have a fence around my property. <laughs> so it's conservative. Um, takes time. 
that's the things you really need to know. And it's not very much money. It's eighteen thousand dollars for a parcel today, in coffee, and twenty four thousand five hundred for a cacao parcel. So it's affordable and uh, attainable for for most people to get started by one or two parcels come on down and kick the trees and get to know the team and all the rest of the things and if you have the financial capability add some more hold on to it forever it's a legacy income uh, once the uh, trees start to kick in and the cherries are there and the specialty coffee is, is flowing out the door in 40,000 pound containers to roasters around the world, the returns are double digit uh, on an annual basis. And those numbers are going to be very hard to replace anywhere else. Yeah. And what I liked when I did the tour, you gave some uh, talks out in the field that I captured on video that I'll, I'll show at the end of this uh, webinar. You don't just plant the tree and then you get rid of the tree. The tree kind of st stays around for many generations. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, the tree, if you plant, if, let's start with a planted tree, plant a new sapling, seedling, and it'll grow and produce cherries in three years, uh, sometimes four, depending on the varietal or the location that you planted it, but three to four years. And then that will produce good coffee for 12 years, more or less, a uh, 15 year cycle. It's like a C curve for all of you engineering people out there. And you imagine climbing up to the left hand side of the C curve and, and the where the output on the tree in cherries and coffee exceeds the inputs, which is fertilizer and labor and all the other things that go into running a coffee farm. As long as you're climbing up the C curve to the top, you're making money, you're economically sustainable, <clears throat> and that works for us. Once you start to decline down the right-hand side of the C curve, then your inputs will start to exceed your um, your take from the tree, and it's time to recycle the tree. You cut that tree down, at the ground level, let the root ball grow up another tree. In three years, it'll produce coffee and then you'll have another 12 year cycle on your hands. So that's 15 years, now 30. And then you do it again. You can cut it a third time. Then that root ball will grow up again, do a 12 year cycle, 15 more. There's 45 years. Then you simply cut the tree down on the third cycle and don't let it grow again and plant a new sapling right beside it and start all over again. So there's no reason on the planet that I can see that this isn't a legacy investment and a legacy income from a continuously producing farm uh, on coffee and cacao that's, ma that's managed properly. And as long as it's managed properly and consistently, it's, uh, it's there forever. Right, and it's you're buying land at the end of the day. You own the land. There's no doubt about that. It's yours to do with, uh, such as you wish, um, except we're not going to let you Put a, sell your, your parcels to a Chinese sock manufacturer and put a factory in the middle of my coffee farm. So we do have a minimum hold of three years and a first rate of refusal to us. So that if you do want out for some reason, the first thing we'll do is give you a psychiatric examination to wonder why you want to sell. But if you do, then there's opportunities will exist for uh, you to do that. And uh, you'll lose money if you do it in the first three years, so there's just not enough time for the investment capital to kick in and produce returns for you. So you'll need to know that this is at least three and better five to seven and better if you don't ever sell it. One of the first things I looked into getting away from Wall Street were the many crowdfunding sites out there, but I just was not into paying another middleman to give me a false sense of security and then take a chunk of the profits from the operator and me, the investor. Check out simplepassivecashflow.com backslash len or text the word money to 314-665-1767. These lending opportunities are exclusive to Simple Passive Cashflow listeners to power operators I trust and will put my brand on the line with. Again, for more information, check out simplepassivecashflow.com backslash len or text money to 314-665-1767. Uh, so let's talk about purchasing a, a parcel because a lot of people get hung up on this. You know, you, it's out of the United States. Ooh. <laughs> so owning assets that do not require uh, reporting them to the U.S. government and you know, kind of maybe kind of talk us through. I mean, you've kind of guided many, many people through this transaction, David. The, the, the reality is that if you do own uh, real estate offshore in your own name, not in the name of an entity, so not in your IRA, not in your LLC, but in your own name that you don't have to report the FATCA or FBAR. Um, if you do own it in your IRA, uh, in, in, either in an LLC in your IRA or not, uh, the, uh, the IRA custodian will, 
report for you and on you and about you because they have to but you don't have to report even through your IRA. The IRA custodian will take care of that. So the only time you would be individually reporting is if you own it in an individual, in an entity in your own, of your own. And uh, we recommend mainly that people don't do that at the start. It costs money to set these entities up. It costs money to run an LLC every year. Fees are pretty high. Um, and there's not a lot of money in this in the first two or three years. So why do that? If you need to change it later on down the road because it fits into an estate planning program or, or for whatever reason you want to do that, that's simply an, uh, an operational issue inside the company and it's no big deal. So owning offshore real estate is a really good way to diversify out of the, out of the country that you live in and out of the currency that you live in um, into the U.S. dollars Arguably, you're still in U.S. dollars in Panama. If you didn't know that, it's the currency of the country here. But you you, you get a diversification in your portfolio that's not uh, in lockstep with the uh, stock market, not in lockstep with the bond market, not in lockstep with the ETFs or any other paper form of an asset. It's a hard asset, offshore, private, professionally run, in an industry that's $90 billion with a B, 400 million cups of coffee drunk every day in the United States alone. Probably the first thing that's on your mind the minute you wake up in the morning. And if that's not just coffee, then chocolate is probably on your mind right after dinner. So we got you. We got you from the morning till the night, everything in between. So it's a, an industry that you want to be part of, particularly when you get a deeded piece of property in a titled coffee farm, 100% professionally managed for you uh, offshore that provides security. That security is important both for you and it's important both for all, all of our people too. We have a socially sustainable program that's important to the native Indian, mainly people who are impoverished farmers, traditionally been farming coffee forever and ever and ever. And unfortunately, sometimes and many times, their own people don't treat them very fairly. And you'll see a native Indian lady with two kids in the field, standing by a farm, by a tree, picking cherries into a five gallon plastic bucket for $2 a day, $2 a bucket. And her rain gear is a hefty garbage bag tied around her shoulders and the kids don't have anything on and they're all soaking wet. They're working hard, it's not easy, and they're not getting paid enough. That just doesn't cut the mustard around here. So we have adopted a socially sustainable program where we take 20% of the farm's gross operating profits, the, the operating profits after the direct costs of running the farm, 20% of that goes into a pool that is for the benefit of the people. And it will float the boats of the people who are dependent on us for their income and for their jobs. And we're dependent on them to do the very best they can in picking the right cherries and picking the ripest cacao pods and processing everything properly so that we can produce specialty cacao and specialty coffee, sell them to the world at these uh, exorbitant prices, which the world is more than willing to pay and, and is inflating every year as the demand for specialty, everything grows. These people get to participate in that three cents to five cents a cup. Um, impoverished farmer is uh, not part of our plan. It's not part of our operating history and we're doing everything we can to destroy that um, business, both in Belize and, and Panama. Uh, people get better. They, they get good work. They don't have to do dis uh, dishonest work or they don't have to try and raise money doing something for their family that isn't necessarily honest or straightforward. They get a great job. They get good wages, 10, 15% higher than everybody else pays. We pay $3 for that can of coffee. Uh, 30 pound bag, um, yeah, uh, 30 pounds of uh, in a five gallon can of coffee, cherries that they pick, we pay $3 for that can instead of $2.25. Doesn't sound like a lot to you guys and all of us that live on bigger bucks in North America, but it's a big money. It's big money for them. And that doesn't make us uh, the most popular person in the farming industry around here because of the wages and the medical and pension benefits and the money we pay them, but that's tough. It's uh, the way we treat our people is fair. And just so you know, 50% of the cost of producing a pound of coffee is in the labor and turnover in labor is expensive. And we have 29 
I think it's now 31 actual farmers that work every day in the field, and we haven't had one employee turnover in the four years we've been operating. That is, makes business sense to me. Yeah, so and, I, and, and I see that this is kind of where you guys excel. I mean, you guys attract the best talent to actually take care and pick. This is the person picking the right, the right berries and leaving the bad ones. So it's a very uh, high care kind of job and, you know, it's just all around. It's a good thing. I think a lot of these, you know, a lot of these guys are like natives. So yeah, virtually a hundred percent, right. They don't go to school. Not Up saying that now. there's nothing wrong with that, but they are going to, and uh, you guys kind of make that possible. Yeah. Two years ago, three years ago, we had nine, the socially sustainable program uh, promote, um, put nine kids into school, nine kids into school. Uh, last year, there was uh, 21 kids were in school. And this year, 61 kids are in school. So the idea is catching on. And even a couple of the moms went back to school this year um, to get an education to keep up with their kids, which is really, really good. Um, I think it comes from the fact that dad has got a good job. and uh, He's been working for the farm for four years. He's being treated fairly. They got a cool place to live. It's not up to our standards necessarily, but it's a whole lot better than the normal standards. So they have running water and flush toilets and electricity and five inch foam mattresses to sleep on and a, and a gas operated kitchen stove so they can cook their food properly without causing themselves uh, health, health issues. So all in all, it's a pretty good thing. And I think mom's comfy with the fact that dad's working and the paychecks are every Saturday. We've had uh, 52 payrolls every Saturday for almost four years. That's 200 payrolls and we've never missed one and we've never been late on one. It says 12 o'clock is payday, 12 o'clock is payday. And I think that's got over the years adopted such that mom can relax a little bit and go and look after herself. It's very, very important to us that, that, that this continue and uh, we just got the list to, to, to today so we're arranging the Christmas party we're uh, having a Santa Claus come in and we're flying him in from Mexico and he's going to be Santa for our party and the, the list so far is 92 kids so it's getting big and important the screen tells you here to what I've just finished telling you verbally all the kids these days are investing in the latest fad like tech or cryptocurrency. If I had learned anything these past few years watching the wealthy is that they invest in the most boring stuff and the basic commodities. What is more of a necessity than coffee? To learn more about this boring investment, check out simplepassivecashflow.com backslash coffee. So one of the biggest questions that I went when I went to Panama one of my biggest concerns was like, okay, now, you know, he, you and Darren are here and you definitely are disrupting everything with all the, you know, you're treating these workers a lot better. And then you would think that other coffee farms would be upset with you guys coming in and disrupting this whole model, bringing in outside capital, just beating the pants off their facilities that I was like, well, you know, you always hear about it in Latin America, you know, they just blow up your car or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, I mean, the, the answer I got from yourself and um, the, your team and, and, and just kind of being there, walking around the city, it's just not like that. No, there's, there's zero concerns on safety. My concern for Deborah, my wife and myself and our safety is much more prevalent when we get on a plane and go to the United States, uh, when we're landing in Miami or Houston or wherever we're LA or wherever we're Vegas or wherever we're going for a business trip. Um, America has been in, involved in Panama since the canal and they took it over from the French who were failing to build the canal in 19, I think, uh, 04 and finished it in 1914. And America has been a friend of Panama's for a long, long, long time. And people are very happy with uh, North American people, very used to North American people. Uh, English is spoken in quite a lot of places, though I strongly recommend you pick up some Spanish if you're going to come here. It's a great place to live. I call it a halfway house for gringos. It's easy. You can come here. It's not very far away, two, three hours to the grandkids if you want to retire down here. It's uh, feet, pounds, inches, miles, gallons, yards. Uh, so all of the nomenclature is the same. It's a U.S. dollar. Um, it's a really, really strong economy. It's grown as high as 16% on an annual basis. It's average over 6% GDP growth in the last five years. Um, 
since the Great Recession in 2008 and 9, it's been up over six. The U.S. has never broken over two or is just doing that now and would die for a 6% GDP growth rate. So the economy is booming. There's jobs, there's work, there's cash, there's capital, there's nice people that like who you are um, and are appreciative of our socially sustainable program. And uh, any naysayers have really come and gone and pretty well everybody's on board with what we do. And they know that our shingles out uh, on, outside the office and if they want to sell us their farm, we're the, we're, we're the most logical buyer. We'll pay a fair price with reasonable terms and conditions. And we've closed on 10 of them out of 10 in a row with no hassles whatsoever. So I think people are pretty resigned to the fact that we're here to stay. So the, the social component's all nice and, you know, some people really like it, but, you know, other people are, of course, like, okay, what are the returns, right? Yeah, yeah. No, no, let's stop <laughs> on all that, 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 that laissez-faire stuff and let's talk about the cash. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think you know, your, your wife, Deborah. I mean, she really, that's kind of, she really runs with the, uh, the social sustainability portion of this business, but I think you and I are more, okay, how does the numbers will shake out on this thing? Yeah, I'm going to mean, have an MBA in corporate finance, and, and I, I spent 25 or 30 years putting investors into deals that worked and putting investors into deals that didn't work. And uh, you, can't, you can't win them all, uh, particularly if you're in the venture capital business. And one thing I learned is that if you're not in control of the due diligence and if you're not in control of the outcome, the delivery, then it makes it much more difficult. So we've changed all of that. We are in control of the due diligence. We know what we're getting into. We're not taking somebody else's word for it. And we also know what we have to do to deliver. And we have delivered. We've done two distributions already, annual cash distributions, more or less in the 95% uh, range of what we forecast in the pro forma. So pretty close. And we've done two of those when we were supposed to do them. Uh, and they're, they've been done. The third one will be this fall. They usually go out in September, October after we've had harvested all of the coffee and processed all the coffee and rested the coffee, sold the coffee, got paid for the coffee, and all the same thing happens in cacao. And then we can distribute. And we'll, our third distribution will go out uh, on time this year from coffee. And our first distribution is just about to go out for cacao. We started it a couple of years later, and we're just finishing off a very unique annual report that we're going to send to the cacao participants and the cacao parcel owners in video format. It's the first time we've done it. And I think it's cool, and it's going to be very informative. So we've delivered. Um, we know how to deliver, and delivery is really the key uh, on you making an investment with us or anybody else that you're going to do. And the 10% that we already discussed is, is a, a number that's obtainable and realistic and should actually be uh, low when we, uh, when it's all, all said and done and coffee is being coming off the trees. So I went on one of these uh, coffee farm tours and again, the, I'll, I'll put the video at the end of this webinar, but it's a, it's good fun. It's, it's fun. Good. It's a bunch of like-minded people. We get, 12 to 15 people, we keep it small so we can have a, a group of people that resonate with each other. Um, people meet other like-minded investors on the tour and they remain friends for some length of time, three and four years now. When we've, we've been in business, people are still communicating with each other, passing around their emails, introducing other people and other friends to us and to the, to the industry and to the business. So it's, it's fun. We uh, eat a lot of food, we drink some good wine, we go and kick a lot of trees, we run around farms, we hike, we do this, we do that, we cup coffee in our, our own, we have our own laboratory and we'll teach you how to cup coffee so you can understand what goes on in the professional analysis of a, of a coffee and how the scoring system is put together. And then we'll also teach you how to make a good cup of coffee because there's a million ways for you to ruin really good coffee at home with in the, in the preparing process, you're half asleep in the morning and you want the caffeine, caffeine and the coffee sometimes doesn't get processed quite as properly. So you learn how to do that. And you learn all about the economics of the, of, the, of the business. You'll learn about the socially sustainable program. You'll come and meet the farming people. You'll see how they live. You'll come and meet our biologist, Valentina, and she'll show you our worm hotel. We have our own vermi composting system here where we have millions and millions of California red earthworms in a facility that processes the waste products that come off the processing mill, which we own our own processing mill as well. And those waste products that come off there are, 
are handled such that there's nothing toxic going into the environment. So it's a zero, um, a zero sum game when it comes to the effluents and the, the byproducts of the processing where nothing reaches the environment. And we managed to take back quite a bit of the product so that we could use in our own system to recycle things like the perigamino parchment paper that surrounds a coffee bean gets gathered up in big bags and we use that in our furnaces to produce the heat that dries the coffee so everything gets used up nothing gets wasted and nothing goes to the environment that's, that's toxic or damaging and we're proud of that so it's, a, it's a big deal for us the environmentally sustainable part of the three pillars that we have are is important it's not just lip service as well yeah, so I bought probably like beginning of last year, I think. I think it's one of the higher altitude ones, which I was kind of excited about getting that one. You know, now now it's kind of like the first big, big crop that's coming out this year, right? This year's crop isn't going to be too big. Uh, it'll be, a, there's a cycle in coffee and a, it's a two year cycle. There's sort of a boom and bust. There's a boom cycle is when it, everything comes out and it, it, there's a lot more than you would, would normally expect. Then the next year, there's somewhat less of uh, what you can expect. This year is a somewhat less year of a natural cycle of two years. Um, and most of the coffee that we planted is still too young to produce coffee. So the producing farms that we bought and the people invested in will produce coffee more or less on the same amount as, as last year more or less on the same amount for the distribution more or less the same amount we forecast because we know what we're doing when we did the forecast because it's all based on the parameters of a coffee business that's mature in Boquete so we just use the numbers that have been going on for 250 years here didn't try and reinvent any wheels just use what we knew we had so the coffee but next year will be a little bit bigger about 2020 is when the r real coffee starts to hit the ground and and these 250,000 trees are all going to start producing coffee um, at that time and in cacao the same the, the three-year cycle is underway we've got trees that are a year old that look like they're a year and a half old so they may produce in two and a half years so maybe only a year from now and they'll start to produce but not in huge quantities but in the quantities we forecast in the Form. So it's a slow burn. It's a startup for the trees themselves. It's not a startup business. We're four years at it now. We understand what we're doing. We've raised ten million dollars and put it, invested it in the two countries, um, and we have a, a good team and a good operation going here. So the delivery part is is, is a given. We understand what we're doing. It just takes, as I've said before, a little time to get to get the nature on side and she's going to go at her own pace we know what that pace is so we forecast that pace and if that forecast is amenable to you then this is a great place for you to invest if it's not then it's not a great place for you to invest <laughs> go back to the stock market yeah. <laughs> <laughs> trade options or something yeah 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 so anything we missed david you didn't tell people you know i'll start playing that video that i put together of my, when i went and visited you guys and if you guys are interested uh, more, check out simplepassivecashflow.com backslash coffee. Um, put together a bunch of more uh, text and uh, information out there. But, uh, thanks for the mug. Cool. I That's a great picture of, you got there. <laughs> I drink out of every day when I'm stuck in that cubicle. Yeah, well, that won't be forever, will it? No, no. No. So the when people come to you, then they can come through to us. Uh, uh, we can explain to them the, the, what the options are. There's some retail pricing for one parcel, but there's some package deals that are available now that weren't available when you were starting, and there are, but they are available now to all of our owners and to anybody that comes on board. And the, where if you have a three parcel package or a six parcel package, there's some significant discounts that are available to somebody who wants to get started at that level. Right, right. Yeah, there's it's just a little tricky wiring the funds to Panama. I think that's Sometimes the, it can be the only difficult part, but it's it's mostly unfortunately the bankers in the U.S. and Canada that can't fill out a form. Um, it, the information is always available, and the people that can fill out the form correctly, the bankers that can fill out the form correctly, the the wire comes in that that, that day or the next day in without fail but if they don't put the right numbers in they leave out the account number they put the information in the wrong spot the international financial system is so tight nowadays um, that it'll get kicked back it's just the reality so 
we provide the instructions. We request that everybody fill in the, the forms and send us the forms, take a picture and send it to WhatsApp and Darren will vet the form, make sure it's accurate, then go back to the bank or, or up to the counter again and give it to the banker and let them fill it out correctly. And if that's done, it's simple. If it's not done, it just doesn't happen and it becomes a pain. <laughs> And unfortunately, the banking industry is not all that great these days, and most of the kids that work in the bank don't know where Panama is and uh, have probably never sent to an international wire <laughs> in the three weeks they've been working at the bank. And so that uh, makes it a little more difficult for us. But if people follow the bouncing ball, it'll, it'll, it'll happen. All right, David. Well, thanks for uh, joining us. Um, if you guys are interested, again, shoot me an email, Lane, at Simple Passive Cashflow, and check out the URL, and uh, I'll play that video right now. All right, man. Thanks very much for the time and stay away from the lava. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.